at the best salespeople I've seen, they really do want to create value for the customer. So they start from this point of deeply understanding beyond the functional aspect, what are my customers struggling with? How can I make their lives easier? Hi, everybody. This is Jason Mark Campbell, and welcome back to the Selling with Love podcast. I have a returning guest today, which is a person that I highly look up to. I've been monitoring his work, and my God, I start dating myself, realizing that it's been about 14, 15 years since I'm aware of the work that he's been doing, starting with the business model, ontology, the thesis he originally wrote, to the world that he created, a fan following, a cult following of people that are the business model generation. This man has created what is known as the business model canvas, which was the focus of the episode last time. And now we're going to go much deeper on something that as salespeople, we definitely want to pay attention to. This is the value proposition canvas. See, if you're looking to sell your services to somebody or to a company, there's things that you can start doing to really refine what you offer to actually solve problems for your customers. Now, this could be something that's a bit difficult to navigate, but what if there was a tool that can make it crystal clear and empower you to design your product to do just that? fit like a glove on the problems you solve. And so Alex Osterwalter is our guest today. Um, he is the uh, one of the partners at Strategizer, one of the core founders, which is a consulting firm that helps all of the big companies that you might have heard of, such as Microsoft, Coca-Cola, Nestle, MasterCloud, and the list goes on. And he's here with us with such an honor. Alex, welcome to the show again. Thanks for having me again. Pleasure to be here. Well, uh, last time we talked a bit about the business model, it's one of the tools, and I know you're a fan of using many tools like a surgeon, right? You want to be able to have tools to go into a business, to diagnose, to solve, and you found that this whole idea of having a value proposition canvas was detecting a problem that most people had in companies, and this tool was created as a result of that. Can you elaborate on what were you seeing that forced you or at least inspired you to want to create a tool like this? You know, with the first tool, with the business model canvas, we help people articulate what their business model was when they had one and the, the business model they wanted to build when they were, you know, in, on, a, on an entrepreneurial journey or a venture journey. So one thing that we've seen is that people are not so good at articulating how they're creating value for customers. So we thought, well, probably there should be a tool there around more the product focus, right? Because to succeed in business, you need a couple of things. So you need to create value for customers and you need to create value for your business. The second one we answered with a business small canvas. And for the first one, we went to see, you know, is there anything there? Because, you know, we don't like to reinvent the wheel when there are already good tools there. So everybody sells, everybody's trying to create value for customers, but there was no tool to visualize what it exactly is that you're doing and to articulate. And that's incredibly important because, A, you get it out of your head and you can you know, work with the team and you can align. And B, it's just a structured way of uh, mapping things out because everybody knows the performance of their products and services. Everybody can rattle that down. But actually, not that many people can clearly articulate how they're creating value for customers. And that's the key to uh, success you know, in business and in sales around you know, it, within a business model. I'd be curious to know, because I know you've done so much studies, you work with big organizations, and this tool didn't exist before. And so what were you seeing? Are there examples of what was happening that when this tool didn't exist, people were just going like, yeah, this is the way it works. And there was a mismatch or there was a loss of sales or profits. What was going on? So I'll give you one um, anecdote, <laughs> maybe not now from the, from the big corporate world, but I also worked a lot with accelerators around the world. And I was at one big accelerator in Portugal. And I walked around from one team to another and asked them, well, how are you creating value for customers? And every single founder would talk about the performance of their product. Our product does this. Our service does this. You know, it's this fast. It looks this good. And that's all okay. But it actually doesn't matter if it doesn't connect with something customers care about. And you know, it's, it's very trivial, right? It's a very trivial statement that I'm making. But the, the, the thing is, we need to go back to basics. People don't always articulate that. Or when they search you know, for the right thing to do, 
they don't always focus on the right thing. So tools make us better at what we're already doing. Again, people develop products, you know, in startups, in large corporations, but there's not necessarily a good tool to make explicit. What are we focusing on? You know, which things are we addressing that customers actually care about? So we're too, you know, too focused on, on the performance of our products and services. But again, performance only matters if it connects with something that customers care about. Trivial things. So it's kind of back to basics. But there's so many opportunities to do things that just bigger, better, faster doesn't matter unless it really addresses something that customers care about. Basic, but, you know, common sense is not always common practice. So we need to reinfuse that into our practices again. I love it. And I know we're going to break down some of those essential pieces of the value proposition canvas. Uh, and I feel like this is actually something before this tool existed. I mean, there may be some different ways, but not in a visual concrete way that you illustrated. But I seem to have seen so many companies that were out there saying, oh my God, we're losing customers. So we're going to just do this, add this feature, add that. And they were just shooting in the dark, right? And I feel like some of them kind of completely missed the ball, went out of business. Were there some extreme cases like that that you've seen that, hey, when they started not even connecting to the value, they just went out of business? You know, there's there's some research um, by CB Insights that shows why startups fail. And I think it's a good proxy for why corporate projects fail. We just don't have the same data. And it turns out <laughs> that a lot of startups that fail, they build something nobody wants. So again, you know, it's trivial. Of course, you need to build something customers care about. Well, it turns out a lot of startups don't. There are two challenges there. One is, you know, can you articulate clearly how you're creating value for customers? Can you get your team aligned? And the second one is, you know, did you test and adapt that before actually scaling it? So those two things we need to get right. And, you know, it's such a trivial thing that the data shows we're getting it wrong. And it's not because people are not smart. So I want to be very careful here. I'm not trying to make fun of people. It's because the processes are broken. We need to articulate how we intend to create value. That's first. And then we need to test and adapt because usually we're going to get it wrong. So there's a whole art today in how do we do customer research in the 21st century? It's, it's a little bit different from the past. We need to be extremely fast and adaptive. Initial ideas don't really matter. Everybody has a vision of how we could create a, you know, new products and services, but the success is in the details and that you only figure out when you constantly test and adapt an idea, a, a value proposition, a product or service until it does exactly what it should do because there is no such thing as the creative genius that gets it right up front. It's a process where you first map out, then ask what are the hypotheses, then you test. Very fast and iterative process. And the good news is we now know how to do that systematically. Again, you know, since business existed, we're trying to create value for customers. But now we're starting to have a really good process. We know how to do this extremely well. I, uh, I do want to point out, and of course, I'll have links to things like your book about the value proposition canvas. I can't currently have your high impact tools for teams. Your, your team was nice enough to send me that one. I just want to give a, a heads up and kind of a kudos to every piece of literature, every book that was released by Strategizer are these beautiful illustrated books that become so easy to apply. And so if you're already curious about this, this is something I'll encourage you to go pick up a copy of these books. They're the most beautiful functional books that you can use. And I think they're of high value. So definitely go and check the link in the show notes I'm going to add that, which brings me to a point before we actually explain the big pieces here, Alex, which is I have a lot of listeners that might be at different stages. Mind you, I would say mostly early stages. I wanted to know if this is a tool, let's say I haven't even made my first sale and I just went out as a self-employed consultant, uh, coach, um, creative. Is this a tool that I can use? And if I already have my business started, am I too late to use it? <laughs> no, it's at, at any stage, right? So Basically, the value proposition canvas helps you make explicit you know, which jobs, pains, and gains you address for your customer. How do you create value for your customer? You do that at the idea stage, but you actually also have to renew that when you're further down the road. I remember the very first time you know, I was really using this at, at scale. It was at, in a workshop with MasterCard, and we were more in the ideation creative kind of stage. But then they asked, well, we could apply this to check if our products and services are still creating value. So of course, you need to do that check all the time. So it's a simple tool that's not prescriptive, 
in terms of content, it's prescriptive in terms of what do you look at? What are the questions you need to ask? And the questions are slightly different um, when you're early stage or when you're assessing your value proposition. But the areas that you need to address are exactly the same. It's the customer, it's the product, and a couple of sub-questions within that, that uh, category. Brilliant. So I'd love for this point to kind of highlight some of those major elements and break them down. Because I know from one side, we talk about a customer's perspective, and then we talk also from a company perspective and the product or service we create. So let's start from the customer side, which seems to be the place that is most ignored. And we spend maybe not as much attention as we used to. So can you break us down? What are these major elements? Yeah. So maybe just first to build on, there's an important thing here is that as a creators, as companies, as salespeople, we're, we're often very product focused because we have a vision, we, you know, we have something on the table and we need to flip that. And we need, to, we need to put ourselves, you know, sometimes literally into our customer shoes and understand their perspective often beyond the space of your product to really see what is, you know, their context, what do they care about most? So we need to deeply understand customers. And when we created the value proposition canvas and this part, the customer profile, we built on an existing concept. So we didn't want to reinvent the wheel everywhere. We built on the jobs to be done concept. It's something that was launched by several groups that two best known are Tony Ulwoik and Clay Christensen. And you basically first ask, what are customers trying to get done? Not what do they want, right? Because often customers don't know what they want, but they know exactly what they're trying to get done. And so you start with that and then you ask, okay, what is preventing them from getting that done? Those are the pains, things that they might fear, things that are holding them back from getting a job uh, done well. And then you get the objectives. What are the outcomes they're looking for? Those are the gains that they're looking for from getting a job well done. So a, a silly one, right? So let's say, um, we're in the fashion business and we're talking to people and then our customers say, well, I buy fashion because I want to look good. Okay? That's a job to be done. I want to look good. Well, that's pretty abstract. Tell me a, what's holding you back from looking good. Oh, the process of shopping is annoying. I hate doing that. So that's a pain, right? Or I don't really know if it's, it's kind of risky to, to wear something that it's uh, extravagant, right? Those are all pains. Now, what about the gains? You ask, okay, you want to look good. What does that mean? How do you know if you look good? Oh, if I get compliments from my partner, from my you know, work colleagues, those are the gains. So you start to map that out. Jobs, pains, and gains. And you start to get a very good understanding of the customer. And often, rule of thumb is when you do more radical innovation, you need to go beyond the scope of your product or service because you want to deeply understand. You might have to kind of reframe things. If you're doing very incremental innovation, it's okay to be more narrow. When you're selling, it's the same thing. You know, sometimes in some contexts, you need to understand the bigger context of the customer so you can actually land the sales by looking at very different aspects. So often, you know, we, we, when we talk about jobs to be done, we're very functionally focused. Oh, you know, this is, uh, this is what it is about. But, you know, even in business to business, there's often a social component. How am I perceived by others? So let's say you're selling B2B software. Well, the functional job to be done for your customer is that it has to, you know, do certain things. But turns out, often the purchasing, you know, people who are purchasing, they don't just make functional decisions. They make decisions that are more related to social. Ah, but if I buy this state-of-the-art software, you know, I will, seen, I will be seen as an innovator. Or quite the contrary, you know, if, if I buy this piece of software, I'm going to take a huge risk and my peers are going to kind of say, well, you're crazy, you're doing all this new stuff, can't you go for the basics? So there's not just the functional component, there's social aspects to that as well. So we really need to have a deep understanding of customers, not trivial, and that's what the customer profile is about, asking jobs, pains, and gains, and mapping those out. So you need to have 50 sticky notes on your customer profile that you're mapping out um, before you have any understanding. And, you know, it, as a general kind of note, all the companies I've worked with, 
don't have, they think they have a deep customer understanding, but they rarely do. They can't make very explicit based on data, based on evidence, what are the most important things to the customers? So they think they can, and then I ask two, three questions, and then you know it all falls apart, and you can see their, their understanding is superficial. I'm working on my own, uh, my own book, and the Selling with Love actually has a methodology which speaks about five loves in selling. The second love is to love the buyer, and the best way to show love is to understand, which is why I'm so excited that you're here because I think your tool is one of the most powerful tools to help people better understand their customers. And you talk about these jobs, and I love this example in fashion because you can understand, okay, it's it's abstract, but it's real. That's kind of an objective you're trying to reach. In a B2B setting, I can see maybe the objectives of jobs that need to be done. Maybe there's like broken processes that need to be fixed, some speed of implementation that needs to be done. I wanted to know if you had a good example, maybe in a B2C level, maybe as a as a consultant or, or, or I guess on a small business level where let's say somebody's trying to improve somebody else's life. Like what what, what are we looking at here? Yeah, you, you need to, let's say you are, you know, a design consultant or a digital, you know, marketing consultant. You really need to go and deeply study beyond just the very functional stuff. You know, oh, I'm going to help you improve my conversion rates. And so that's obvious, right? That's the that's a no brainer. But what you want to deeply understand is, let's say you're going after a specific type of a customer segment. That's the first thing. Like what's, you know, who are you really addressing? Again, trivial question, but you go after a certain profession. Let's say you're going after... Uh, hotel owners. That's very different than if you go after, you know, small business owners in, in a completely different category. So you want to deeply understand what are they struggling with that's holding them back from doing good digital marketing. For example, and you'll figure out, oh, time is a terrible, you know, challenge because you have to. If you're in the hospitality industry, you start early, you end late, so they might just be distracted. Or you start to go deep into, okay, they seem to understand. Why are they not doing it themselves? Well, because of this and because of that. So you really want to dig deeper beyond that narrow scope that you have to sell. And it's a well-documented fact that the best salespeople, they you know, deeply love and understand the customer. They're not focused on you know, just uh, uh, pitching a product and trying to sell whatever. They really want to. I do believe that the best salespeople I've seen, they really do want to create value for the customer. So they start from this point of deeply understanding beyond the functional aspect, what are my customers struggling with? How can I make their lives easier? And sometimes you'll say, look, I'm not, that's really, really important. Sometimes you'll say, I don't have a product or service that's going to help you. You're better off going to my competitors who do this. And, you know, that's not always an easy thing to do, to leave money on the table. But I think it just gives you that longer term reputation. So deeply understanding customers will over time also help you build up an incredible trust uh, from the customer side. And again, some of these things might seem like, a, a, you know, common sense, but they're not common practice and tools help us make them common practice, right? So common sense is not always common practice. And tools help us make this more s- systematic and more fun. I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to deny that aspect of the fact that you have very colorful charts and fun pies that you can fill in with the sticky notes and the whole process. Uh, whiteboards are encouraged when we work with your tools. And I was going to say, like, I know for a fact, like, I had a recent customer. I realized that what they actually needed was more some like like I was going to give them some sales consulting and I realized they had more of a mental uh, barriers that they needed to overcome. So I like this high type of job that you spoke of being like the social context, but there's also like the self concepts, right? Like there's the mental health. I could just imagine even in a B2B setting, if you're trying to roll out a brand new, say, uh, CRM into a company and you have the latest and greatest technology, I guess one of the jobs is their own mental health. Adapting to change is a very painful thing, causing stress, and you're needing to deal with that, minimize that, right? There's this, there's this concept of emo- emotional jobs as well, right? So you can break it down into functional jobs. It's really related to the solution. Social jobs, how are you perceived by others? And emotional jobs, which is more about how you feel, just what you addressed. So if I'm selling investment products, the functional job is performance. The social job might be, oh, oh, you're working with that, you know, venture capital firm or that bank. Oh, that's prestigious. So that's 
about perception. And then you have the emotional job. Oh, I don't care that much about the performance. I don't care about what others think, but I want to invest in startups. I want the fun of it. If I lose the money, doesn't matter, right? So that's an emotional job. So as you know, a salesperson or a product creator, you want to understand those different jobs. Functional jobs, pretty straightforward and obvious. Social jobs, how you know, do they think they're perceived when they're purchasing a product or service? Um, emotional jobs, what does it mean to them emotionally? <laughs> does it give them peace of mind? All that kind of stuff. And then you have the supporting jobs, which is more about the process. Oh, this is very easy to purchase. So if you really deeply understand what customers are trying to get done, you know, a lot of the other things happen almost naturally. In particular, when you then ask what's holding them back from getting a job done well, and what are they looking for in terms of outcomes for a job done well? So it's, it's pretty straightforward, but it's a lot of work. And in a B2B context, if you're selling to a company, usually you have four different customer segments. You have the users who might use your software. You have the influencers who are going to do the recommendations. You have the purchasing department and you have the decision makers. So you need to do the homework and really start mapping that out for the different customer segments. There is no such thing as an enterprise buyer. It's people, and those are different people with different jobs to be done. So often in a business-to-business con context, you have several value propositions. So the same product or service will have a different value proposition to users, to the purchasing department, or to the decision makers. And you need to make that explicit. And, you know, in particular, early stage, you know, young entrepreneurs or product creators, they don't always understand that. They think, oh, I have one product. That's, you know, what creates value. But you need to ask, how does it create value for the different segments within the company that I'm selling to? I love that. And uh, I'm going to go on a limb and make a guess here, and which would be that one of the best ways to do this, you you obviously have some things that you know, some assumptions from your existing past customers. Uh, you're obviously would be encouraging maybe grabbing some of your best customers and interviewing them, surveying them, finding ways to be in communication with them. Would those be the best tools that you would say to get started once you have an established consumer base? Yeah, I think it's it's fine to, you know, do it in your meeting room or on your whiteboards. and But then immediately, you know, based on what you already know or what you don't know, that's okay. But the next step is to make explicit which things do you know or you have real evidence. Oh, I've talked to 10 customers in the past in those sales conversations. The same thing came up all the time. That's, you know, evidence. You have some evidence there. But then there's things that you don't know that seem obvious, but you should never believe the obvious. You want to have evidence to support that. Oh, the, my competitors do that. Well, what do you know? Maybe they're failing. So just because they're doing it doesn't mean, you know, you don't want to copy somebody's back when you don't know what's going on in the front. So interviews is a good start to get more evidence, to gather more evidence. But then there's a whole, you know, sophisticated tool set to go deeper and collect evidence because what people say and what people do is never the same thing. You know, you ask me, oh, if I gave you this tool, would you go to the, would you work out every day? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> and then the reality is, okay, that's my ambition and my hopes and my dreams, but the reality is it's not gonna make a difference at all. So you use experiments with call to actions. You know, very well known, you put up a landing page where people have to sign up with an email. You do pre-sales and pre-purchasing. And sometimes you might actually, uh, you know, kill that project and give the money back to customers. We've done that a ton at Strategizer. So you need to go beyond interviews. Interviews is a great start, but it's the most basic. I usually say it's, you know, it's level one evidence. It's very light. It's a good start, but you should never believe what people say because what people do and what people say is not the same thing. So we wrote a whole book with David Bland on that called uh, Testing Business Ideas. So we need to get more sophisticated in how we collect evidence. And it's beyond the traditional focus groups and all that. Nothing against that, but it's not good enough. Today, with the Lean Startup Movement and Testing Business Ideas by David Bland and Strategizer, we have a really good library of ways how to collect evidence how to prove that your ideas actually are right because ideas are free and they're usually wrong. Steve Blank likes to say, the grandfather of the lean startup movement, he likes to say there's a fine line between vision 
and hallucination. So you better go and test if you're right. I love this. And, you know, it, it, it's a bit of a, a sobering statement knowing that, you know, doing the interviews is just a level one. There's so much deeper research you can do. And every time you do it, you become more aware to how exactly you get to solve this. We haven't even talked about product yet. I know we'll touch on it a little bit. But again, the focus here is here's what happens when you deeply do the research on the customer. I'm, I'm wondering, Alex, if there's a, a level zero for people who are just starting out, right? Because they don't even have an existing customer. And now it feels like, hey, if I'm, am I starting with, am I starting with, because I, I have an idea of a product I might want to create. Maybe I'm a designer. So then I'm like, I can make design. So I could target the entire world. Like, do you have to just take a hypothesis? I usually encourage people to like pick a possible customer group and then start there. Are there other things that Absolutely. you recommend? Absolutely. Look, I think... You know, level zero is making your assumptions explicit. How do you intend to create value? Oh, I hope to help this customer segment, you know, speed up their process by 10%. That's an intent. That's great. But you need to make that explicit. And you need to make explicit which specific things that your customers are struggling with are you going to target? That's a starting assumption. And that's absolutely fine. Sometimes you have, abs you have absolutely no evidence, right? There are many... Uh, disruptive entrepreneurs, they go into a new field that they don't know. And that's okay. And it doesn't always, so sometimes people say, you always have to start from a deep customer understanding. Well, the starting point could be patents that you have. What you have to then do is end with a customer, you know, job pain or gain that you're solving, which means very rapidly try to test, you know, if I apply this technology for that problem, very quickly you test with customers. And then if it doesn't, you didn't spend a lot of time, money, and energy, and you pivot to something else. That's okay. But you can't start with technology. And that's what technology entrepreneurs often do. They don't necessarily start with a very clear, articulated customer problem that they have seen in the field. That's okay. But you need to gather that evidence very quickly. And that's the challenge is that um, too many entrepreneurs and product creators they're excited about their product and they think they need to start testing from a product perspective. So you know, they say, oh, I need to go and have a prototype to show this to customers to learn. No, no. The first thing you need to learn about is jobs, pains, and gains. Yeah, this doesn't matter because if you show a, a prototype too early of a product or a service, what, what's going to happen? You're going to frame the conversation around this. And, you know, people are friendly. They're never going to tell you, I don't really care about this. What I'm struggling with is over there. So you should never really start with uh, building a prototype or a, you know, something that is super tangible. You don't need that. The first thing I want to see is evidence that you understand customer jobs, pains, and gains. Again, sounds like a trivial statement, but most people start first with building something, even a fast prototype, is a waste of time. Because if you've built something, just mocked it up for two hours, you just wasted your time if customers really don't care. So you first want to understand the customer. Again, start with that. And then you can get to your solution, you know, early enough. I love it. And we spent most of this conversation here really going into these jobs, these pains, these gains. And the more jobs that you can identify from these customers, then you try to validate that. You try to find the evidence to show that each job is actually something that needs to be done that actually has these pains and has these gains. And now your system becomes much more robust. And you can take it to an extent that, you know, you can maybe do it light at the beginning, then you get more data, you refine, you refine. And the more you get it refined, it starts fueling you making better decisions from product side. I wanted to us to quickly touch on what happens when you have these three major elements. You have the jobs, you have the pains, you have the gains. I know we have this other view of the value proposition canvas, which is now we're looking internally. So could you just see how these three elements match with our customer side? Yeah, So and, it, and it's important to split those, right? Because on the customer side, you don't design the customer, you understand the customer deeply. The choices you make are then on the left-hand side of the value proposition canvas, you're gonna make choices how your products and services address customer jobs, pains, and gains. So you have products and services. That's what it starts from, a bundle of products and services. But then you make a choice. Okay, how are my features going to be a headache pill and take away some of the pains? We call that pain relievers. How is your product or service a pain reliever? Or on the other hand, you know, how is it a gain creator? How does it help customers materialize on some of the objectives. 
So products and services don't create value per se. They create value for very specific customers in terms of relieving pains, taking away those blockers that are holding customers back from doing a job well, or creating gains, helping customers get those jobs done well. And you make that explicit. So on the, on, on the product side, you make choices. And it's not that you always need to address the most important customer jobs, pains, and gains. Yours, it's important. It's not a trivial thing. Because if your competitors do some of the most important things already extremely well, you might not want to join in to that rat race and try to do the same thing. So you're going to look at which jobs, pains, and gains do customers struggle with are important enough and completely underserved, undervalued. And then how do you do that? If you take Tesla, what's really interesting is from the start, when Mark Tarpening um, and, uh, and uh, Martin Eberhard, when they launched as co-founders, they launched Tesla, they had testing in the DNA. They didn't just build something. They first uh, did a series of experiments. One was what we call boomerang. You know, you use existing electric vehicles to see what customers think. And they were really ugly. They looked like golf carts. So they started to get an understanding. Then they actually bought a Lotus Elise. They took everything out, <laughs> turned it into something that they would call an electric vehicle. And then they could work with customers to kind of see, okay, which jobs, pains, and gains regarding an electric vehicle do they care about, are, mo- are important enough? And maybe, you know, not served well by the traditional car manufacturers. So it turns out with an electric vehicle, you can speed up your car much faster. Those things. And then they went on um, to do some experiments with landing pages and pre-purchases. But you make product decisions and you need to make those based on the jobs, pains and gains of customers that are underserved. And here's very important that they're willing to pay for because there are a lot of things that customers care about, but they're not willing to pay for. So it's a, it's a back and forth between your product design. Then you go back to, okay, well, I need to understand this aspect of the customer again. Okay, I'm pivoting to this. So it's a back and forth. It's not sequential. Customer understanding, product design. No, it's back and forth. You adapt the features in your product and services. You know, it's an iterative process based on your evolving understanding of customer jobs, pains, gains. But what's important is you make choices. You make choices based on what customers care about, what they're willing to pay for, and, you know, competition. But don't start with differentiation first. Differentiation is an outcome of creating value for customers. So you don't differentiate to differentiate. That would be wrong. Don't look at competitors. Forget competitors. What you really care about is designing for the customers, and it will come up enough. They will say, oh, you know, with uh, normal cars, I don't get this and I don't get that. So focus on the customer, and differentiation will happen as an outcome. It's a beautiful side effect of understanding customers. You know, as a salesperson, I could just imagine jumping into any company that would have this mapped out at a level two or a level three, like having all the list of those jobs, pains, gains, and then looking at the initial product where it has all the pain relievers, the the gain boosters, as well as that. uh, What's the main one? It's the the product features. So we, we talk about products and services, the bundle of products and services, and they relieve pains and they create gains, right? So that's it. Again, it's only in the context of a specific customer segment. So you shift the customer segment, all of a sudden, the same products and services create zero value. The the trivial one is you go from one country to another, guess what? Same product or services, you know, don't uh, don't address the same jobs, pains, and gains because the customers in, you know, uh, Singapore don't have the same jobs, pains, and gains as the customers in Switzerland. I have a... I have to share a little thing that I purchased yesterday, which I think illustrates your points really well. Uh, and it's basically, I often have to do covers for my podcast. So I always ask my authors to send in pictures and then you have to, I have my designer, they have to mask the, the hairline and make it all the background disappear so I can put them on my background. And so my designer does this and sometimes, you know, not perfectly, there's a bit of, but, and I'm like, wouldn't it be nice if there was a tool that could do this more efficiently? And I had a friend show me this amazing, powerful photo editing tool costs like 99 bucks and it's a powerful tool. And I look at it and I'm like, God, that looks complicated. And I ended up, and I'm doing a free plug here, but I end up getting this software called Cutout. What does it do? It just removes the background. I drag an image, AI removes the background, spits it out automatically. Now, 
I see this, that you could, they could have multiple customer segments, but being so specific on what my job was, the pain that I had with it, the gains I was looking to have, they created the product that was specific for me. And I was like, here we go. No brainer. And now I've made a purchase and they just got a free ad for doing it. But again, these, like I'm thinking when somebody has this well-developed as a salesperson, it becomes so easy to write copy. It becomes so easy to sell it. It becomes so easy to find the target avatar where they're hanging out. The whole job of the business of selling becomes easy because this is the necessary work that can be done ahead of time. So and it's, a, it's a beautiful example, what you illustrated, of focusing on few things, but doing those few things extremely well. And, you know, it, it turns out that some companies are better at this and some companies not. Some companies try to address almost every job pain and gain. And the, the reality then is it doesn't create value for anybody. So sometimes you have to go really narrow before you go broad. And, and what the example you gave is a beautiful one of, of focusing on very few things, but doing that extremely well. I can't touch Photoshop. I'm just saying. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing with us. Again, for everybody tuning in, what I really wanted you all to understand is when you start using a beautiful tool like the Value Proposition Canvas, you start having a better understanding of your buyer and you can start doing the work, dividing it by the jobs that they're trying to get done, whether it's the emotional, social, or functional jobs that they're trying to do. You can look at each of these jobs and what pains does it have? What gains are they looking for? And start mapping that out more and more. You take assumptions if you begin with the target market you hope to serve. If you have have existing customers, you can do a bit of focus group surveys, but even more than that is see how you can test it and really do even more looking at the data, looking at the behavior. And this is where companies will start hiring companies like Strategizer to do an excellent job while doing that. Now, once you have that done, you can start looking at what products and services you're created, what pains do they remove, what gains do they boost? And this is how it works together. If this seems at all in any way overwhelming, you're a visual person, know that we're putting a link to some YouTube videos. There's so much content from Strategizer where they can show you what it looks like. You can download a copy of the canvas itself. And of course, what I would encourage you even more is to grab a copy of the book so you can really break it down, see how you can apply it. And once that's done, you will turbocharge the way you can sell, market, and grow your business in the process. Alex, such a pleasure to have you on the show. Again, uh, all the best in the future works and thank you for everything you've created so far. It's such a genius work and so helpful for all of us. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. I am your host, Jason Mark Campbell, and this is the Selling with Love podcast.